brand new J Squared podcast, Jesse Cass and Jason Williams. We're so excited to have you here with us. We are going to be talking basketball, basketball, and more basketball with the former NBA All-Star, Jason Williams. Jason, uh, so happy to have you here and, and starting up this new show. Jesse, great to be a part <laughs> of your team, you know? All right, so this is going to be great. An audience, welcome, you know? But before we speak basketball, before, I want to talk about the kid Owen Daffer. Have you ever heard of him? No, let's let's hear it. Um, I, I, I never, ever watch college football just because I'm always working. You know, I'm always at rebound. We have a treatment center down there for drugs and alcohol, so I'm working all the time. But I just happened to put on a point in the game where I think Eastern Carolina was versus North Carolina State. And this guy, it was like 21 to 20. He goes to kick uh, the extra point and misses it. And then the poor kid, they run it all the way back down. They get to where he can kick a field goal for 35 yards at home and he misses the field goal. <laughs> I swear to you, it's the most dramatic. It was, I, I, nothing ripped my heart out more for this kid, Owen Daffer. I was calling all my people like, yo, put, let me speak to this guy, you know, uh, because, you know, the, that, the field goal kicker is something I never wanted to be. <laughs> I hated being on the free throw line. Yeah. But let alone, imagine, and I was asking um, Grayson and a couple of my other friends, Grayson was a kicker. And uh, he works with us down here at Rebound. And I was asking him, if you miss two, the extra point, and then you miss the field goal to lose the game with no time left, do you go to class the next day? <laughs> you know, or do you go to class that week? Or does it take it? Or do you have security, like some old lady from security, you know, <laughs> you know like following you around? Would you go to class, Jesse? I think you need to, because if you don't, then then it gets worse, right? You're going to be on campus. Be where'd he go? Where's this guy? Why is he ducking everyone? What's going on? I mean, the kicker, like you said, is a you're either the hero or you're the goat. There's really no in between. Right. You, you either do yeah. do the job or people are really upset. So uh, it's kind of a thankless job in that way. So right. uh, <laughs> you can't be the winner, right? Because if you you supposed to make the extra point, yeah, right. That's a given. And you're supposed to make everything from 35 yards, you know. So I was just wondering, you know, I, I felt for that kid. That's a, probably the only name I know in college football is that young man. But I'm gonna tell you something. Um, it ain't like look, I played for Luke on the second, and as many a time I have bad games, but I'm from the low east side of Manhattan. Yeah, you know, and I'm also six foot nine. <laughs> um, so you know, this young man is, you know, a kicker, not take anything away from kickers. But What's, he's got to be about five nine, say and the guy slightly smaller stature. <laughs> yeah, just, and just to get out the locker room. Yeah, like my heart went out for him. But like, if he was in my locker room, there'd be no drama, you know, because we had some bad players on our team. We had some guys that, you know, uh, one point guard in particular, um, who was just a one the nice guy in the locker room. Yeah. And then I had to straighten him out and his brothers out and then his friends out. You know, <laughs> one by one, you knock them out, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, it is, you know, this guy, imagine a locker room with, I don't know how many players, 50, 60 players, their shirts off, and they all, you know, looking at this poor guy who can't be all of 150 pounds. Um, so, you know, uh if he's listening to this, give me a call, brother. I, you know, I'm your number one fan because I'm going to watch the next game because I know he's going to uh, get it right through the goal. Now, sure. I'm sure that's appreciated, too, because, as you said, yeah. it's got to be such a such a kind of demoralizing feeling to go through that. And if it is a, like a slightly smaller school, the same thing happened in the LSU game. I mean, that kick got blocked. Right, but right. He might actually have the security. I don't know about the kicker <laughs> hey, <right. laughs> at the smaller but, 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 schools. You know, but, Jesse, but this is the problem. He got to wait a week. Yeah. So like in the NBA, you know, I be on the court tomorrow. Yeah. Missing a, a, a shot at the end of the game, and I was like devastated for him. And he's like, Jay, what the hell are you worrying about? You didn't miss it. I go, but he goes, we play again tomorrow. <laughs> and I was like, wow. Because even in college, you have four or five days. Yeah. And you got to go back on campus, walk around. NBA, you miss a shot. Next day is another one. Yeah, no, that's let's let's start there because I, I yeah. there's so much to talk about with you in yeah. in your career. Uh, obviously, we mentioned the 1998 NBA All Star. 
you know, long double digit playing career over 10 years in the league. Yep. Uh, you played in a, in a rough and tumble time in the league. You were in the nineties when it was that grind out physical right. style. I know that's the style that you played, uh, but kind of some of those insights you were just giving playing 82 games, battling each other every night. What was that like for you going through those battles day to day, year to year through the 1990s? Well, this is the difference, Jesse. You know what is that we had no cell phones or social media. So it, when we saw each other, I hate to say it, it might've been through a, uh, a different lady or <laughs> girlfriend, or it might be a bartender, <laughs> or it might be wherever, but it wasn't through a cell phone or social media. So when we actually, uh, you know, couldn't pick up or like, Today, they, they uh, text each other, they Instagram each other. Everybody's friends. Yeah. We weren't friends. It's just like back in the day when your mother kissed your dad goodbye, you, they knew they weren't going to see each other for 10 or 12 hours. Yeah, yeah. Now, Jesse, you kiss your girlfriend goodbye, <laughs> and, you know, 15 minutes before you get to the parking lot, she called you eight times. <laughs> you know, so there is none. So when we saw each other, we saw each other for real. Yeah. You know, and, and and look, we didn't care. You know, then they wanted to speed the game up. They tried that in Denver, scoring 140 points because of the altitude. It kind of didn't catch on. And, uh, you know, it's like baseball juicing the ball up. But what they did was they took away the hand check, right? So we used to can hand check you. If I put my hand on you, I can see which way you're going. And it was a lot more physical. Yeah. You know, we got hit in the head. Now that's a flavor. You're out for so long. Um, basketball was there where you were going to be on one team for a long time. And we really, truly didn't like each other. And truly, like, I name names because I'm still in pretty good shape and got a good right <laughs> hook. You know, there's some people I see right now that played in the game, you know, probably Shaquille. You know, I love to fight him if I see him. Um, and I had made up, you know, through my 12-step program. <laughs> He was one of my fourth step, you know, ninth step, you know, uh, you know, so I was just like, you know, uh, I got, and I even went on the show and, and I wrote a letter. Why am I mad at Shaquille O'Neal? He never did anything to me. Stay was that because he backed down and people. hit you with one of those elbows? But no, one time I, I took the ball and just hit him and, and, you know, hit him in the face with it. And uh, I, I used to play him tough and uh, just talk too much for me. You know, just, you know, I, I, I heard he's a great guy. Uh, Charles Barkley actually told me that because when he first went on TNT, he used to wrestle Charles Barkley and throw him down. And Charles had a bad shoulder. And his family used to call me, Charles Barkley's family, and say, yo, man, he's too rough. And I used to go, you want me to come to Atlanta and straighten that out? You know, because he's too <laughs> rough on the set. Uh, but I don't know why I was mad at Shaquille, except for maybe he played on a lot of teams because, you know, he couldn't keep the locker room right. A guy that good? And another thing, right? and he's yeah. great. And I don't know uh, how he would react to this, if, if at all. Um, but I cannot remember him ever shooting a jump shot. You? <laughs> I and guess you have to define jump shot. Out. Maybe a little, a, a, a little six foot bank shot. I've seen that. Two but... hands on the ball, never. <laughs> never, the never one dribble. You know, Giannis. You know, not, not just everything was a dunk. Yeah. You know. I'm not saying he wasn't the one of the greatest players of all time, which he was. I'm not comparing myself to him, but you would think somebody in the summertime would say, hey, bro, let's work on a six-footer, Yeah, you know? Let's work on an eight-footer, you know, so. I mean, maybe he felt he could he could get to the dunk every time, so he didn't. <laughs> he thought he had it made. In today's game, he'll get to the dunk every, day, every time. Yeah. But back then, we weren't having that. You think Charles Oakley was gonna let him dunk on him? You think Charles Barkley was gonna let him dunk on him? You can look at Charles. Charles was 6'4 and was the strongest man from the belly button down. Yeah. But from up here, he was strong too, but he never went in the weight room. But you couldn't move him because he was just cornbread and grits. You know, from Alabama, man. Yeah. You know, and I, I, I tell you this one of the worst people in the world to be a rookie on the team with, Charles. Barkley is actually the nicest guy and has the biggest heart I ever met in my life and has a beautiful family. But man, talking about fighting for him, <laughs> everywhere we went, he would say, Jay, you know, um, hey man, uh, J.R. Reed, 
you know, uh, he gave me a hard time. Go. So one day I ran off the bench. I wasn't even in the game. He <laughs> thought I was starting the second game. We were down by 50. He was looking for me. I said, just run him over and I'll help you. Second game ever started. But Jimmy Lyon and the coach heard it and didn't start me for the second <laughs> half. Yeah. So he runs him over and he's looking for me. And I have to run off the bench and run onto the court and start fighting. You know, so we stood in fights in the bars, on the court, everywhere. I was like his bodyguard. And then he would come to practice. This is a true story, Jesse. He'd come to practice and he'd be, he'd get on a bi stationary bicycle. Yeah. And he would go by McDonald's and he'd buy hot cakes. And, with, and then he'd take the sausage and the butter and the syrup and he rolled it up. Right, and they have a Coca Cola, and they put it in a little cup holder, and he'll squish it together with the butter, <laughs> and it looks so delicious. And he'll just be eating it and pedaling one mile an hour, going, "Why don't y'all run the damn floor?" You know, <laughs> and they spitting out, and we practicing because that's why we can't win no damn game. Y'all won't run the floor, and I was like, "Wow!" And then, and then you can see why he can drink and hang out all night because he didn't practice. Yeah. But that's probably why he didn't win the championship. And then, plus, we didn't have, you know, one thing I did know at St. John's, you know, with Lou Connor second, we had a lot of structure. NBA, after practice, you had 23 hours. You know, Lou Connor second made us read a lot. Funniest thing I ever saw was we were stuck in the airport. And, um, and so we, they said, let's not go to the airport. Let's hang out in the hotel. So we hung out in the hotel in the lobby. And uh, we're waiting on the bus because the bus is going to be delayed also to bring us to the hotel. And I look over and Manute Bowl comes, seven foot seven, right? <laughs> yeah. You know, and uh, we could talk some more about Manute Bowls. Uh, uh, I got a lot of Manute Bowls, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know if we're PG here. Uh, but oh, we can be, you be R-rated. It's all good. It'd be R-rated. <laughs> all right. So, uh, I remember a time when Manute Bowl was naked in the locker room. And they had this little guy, and he had the microphone way up here. <laughs> and he was right around Manute Bowl's private, right? Yeah. And Manute Bowl looked down, Manute Bowl had a Johnson like this, and looked <laughs> down at him, and, 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 and hits him on the bottom of the head, and pow! He said, don't you look at that, that long to my wife, that belongs to my wife, <laughs> you know? So, and then... There's blocking so we, shots on and off the court. Yeah, yeah uh, that, so he was the only one, <laughs> hey, Jesse, he was the only one that can drink beer full time because he was seven foot seven and he only weighed about 190 pounds. <laughs> so they, they let him drink Heineken all day. Yeah. My new boy was drunk all day long. <laughs> I come on, you walk around with a Heineken, not even like, you know, in the hood, we at least got to put a bag on it, right? Yeah. He walked through the hotel, into the locker, during the game. <laughs> I'm serious. But, um, I remember this this story that I, and it was my my third day on the team. So there was a paper on the corner there, right? It was yeah. the Wall Street Journal, right? And uh, so I watched uh, Manute Bowl come in and look at the paper, go through it and throw it down. And then Charles Barkley came in, looked through the paper and and, and threw it down, right? And then we had uh, 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 Jimmy Lyon and our coach. He came in, looked at the paper, and threw it down, right? And I never forget Hershey Hawkins, who was a real smart guy, looked over and goes, hey, guys, uh, no need to pick that paper up no more. Somebody's already took out the sports page. <laughs> 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 uh, somebody took out the sports page of the Wall Street Journal. You know there ain't no damn sports page of the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> but uh, oh, but that's, that's the rocket scientist we played with. Oh, that, I mean, I can't wait to hear all, all, all these stories as we go forward. We're going to have so much time to go through all of this stuff. So that's that's just a small sampling. I love that. Uh, you, mentioned, you mentioned Lou Carnesecca, your right. legendary coach from St. John's. You got the St. John's shirt on right now. Uh, you're being inducted into the St. John's Hall of Fame in a couple of weeks on October 22nd. Just what does that mean to you? And, the, and you kind of touched on it, but the relationship between you and Lou Carnesecca and what that meant to you as well. Well, if people that know my history know that I lost three sisters, you know, two, one was stabbed 17 times and got a blood transfusion in 1980 and was the first woman to catch the AIDS virus. Um, and the guy who stabbed her uh, also beat over the face with a hammer. She was a model. And we 
deformed her. And so we had to take away all the mirrors out of our house because she looked horrendous. Um, I thought she looked beautiful. Um, so my sister, Laura, we call her Sissy, started hanging out with her to make her feel better. But what happened there, Jesse, is that they both uh, started using heroin because they couldn't get morphine from the hospital no more. And they both died of AIDS. Um, and so I had two kids and my third sister, husband got drunk, came home, had a bad day, shot her in the face and killed her. And then uh, he shot himself, he killed himself. Wow. Um, so uh, I raised Sissy uh, and Linda's children through St. John's and Jack Kaiser, who just passed away um, at 95 years old, who's the athletic director, let me raise two children who were like, nine and six. So I used to have to wake up every morning, Jesse, get them dressed, me get dressed, get them breakfast. And then I had to eat breakfast, get them to school. One was in Manhattan, one was in Long Island. And then uh, I had to go to class and then go pick them up, pick them up, then bring them to practice. And they'd be in practice, and, you know, Coach Connor said I could practice for six hours. You know, he was <laughs> he was 108 then, you yeah, know, so he yeah. had nowhere to go. Um, so, and then I had to bring them, help them with their homework, do my homework, put them in bed, feed them, and then do the things that the most famous 18-year-old in the world does playing at the most famous university. You know, you still tried to have fun, but you couldn't. Yeah. Um, so that's what St. John's meant to me is that Luke Connor second let me raise two children, and in four years, they missed five days of school. I got my degree and got drafted in the first round, and I couldn't have did it without the athletic director, and I couldn't have done it without my father, Lou Karnaseka. And, um, and let me tell you something. So uh, me and Chris Mullen probably not talking anymore. Uh, he took the job. I love Chris. We were good friends. But he signed something on Coach Karnaseka's wall, and I was always jealous. Because coach always says I'm his favorite player. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So yeah, you, you've heard that, right? I got that in the notes here. I've heard it. Okay. I've got it written down. Right. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's, it's official. It's <laughs> so, yeah, it's official. So he has uh, on his wall, he don't have a picture of me. It was a picture of Chris uh, on the USA team, on the dream team. And he's taking the jump shot, lefty. And it says, sign, you know, Chris signs his autograph and it says, imagine if I can run and jump. So, <laughs> After he was relinquished or whatever happened, he's no longer at St. John's as the coach. I went on to duck Coach Karnaseka's new statue, and Chris didn't show up. So I said, you know what? I was pretty perturbed. Yeah. Uh, so I said, Coach, in his office, it should not say, imagine if I could just run and jump. It should say, imagine if I could run, jump, coach. <laughs> and that didn't go over well with Chris. Uh, so uh, we kind of acted. Somebody thought it'd be a good idea for him to do my induction speech. So I'm, I'm going to tell you how many kites he told me to go fly. You know, so, <laughs> so uh, yeah, I'm excited, man. But the guy who is inducting me, his name is Bill Janicek. Um, and, you know, and to be honest with you, you know, I thought I was already in. <laughs> I thought I was already in the damn Hall of Fame until somebody told me I won. And that was about four years ago. Because Coach Rutledge, who's the best recruiter, Hall of Famer. Yeah. He got Chris Mullen, Walter Berry, Mark Jackson, Malik Sealy, all these great players to go to St. John's. Um, he was giving a, I was giving his induction speech. And then I turned the mic over to Ron Rutledge. And now at this time, I'm eight years sober now, but at this time, I was drinking. Yeah. So he got up in front of the Waldorf Astoria and froze. <laughs> so I was like, oh my God, I got to do something. Yeah. So I went up there and I said, coach, don't worry about it. I whispered in his ear. I said, how much money did somebody ever donate to their favorite college? What athlete is the most? He said, uh, Stephen, Stephen Smith, I think gave Michigan. He's whispering his eyes wide open like, $2 million. So I said, I'm drunk. So I go, all right. I go, in Coach Rutledge's name, 
I'm gonna donate two point one million dollars. <laughs> I was gonna say, did you go two point one? Just like Price is Right, you're like what, one dollar over. Yeah. <laughs> but my father is a big man with a big stomach, right? Yeah. And he's like, it's the way to come to, you know, the the, the thing you wear, <laughs> you know, around your tuxedo, and it goes around. And every time he had to put it on, what's it called, Grayson? What the Grayson don't even have a tuxedo. And what is it called? Just the, oh, the uh, cummerbund right here. A cummerbund. Yeah. And he hated putting that on. He used to go, why I got to put this on? I ain't got no back problem. He's from the South. <laughs> yeah. He used to say, and, 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 and it, was just, it feel like a girdle, Jason. A grown man ain't supposed to be wearing this. And my dad was really quiet, but a funny guy, but he would never step out of bounds. But when he heard me say $2.1 million, he came running up in his head. <laughs> And he go, oh no, oh no, people thought it was a part of the skin. He go, yeah. oh no, my, 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 my son drunk. He ain't trying to give St. John's that kind of money. And I'm like, yeah, dad, I'm giving it. I just signed on the man. It's okay. He's like, no, Jason. He was a brick mate. So he go, you know how many brick we got to lay to make two million dollars? He said, all you're going to do is give the Catholic church two point one dollars and they already got money. He said, and all they're going to give you is a, is a plaque. He said, you don't give the Catholic Church no money. They got money. He's like, sorry, Ron, you can't get this money. And he was like, you know, everybody, everybody thought it was a skin. Yeah. So that, that, that was the kind of relationship that me and my dad had. I was the first player ever, Jesse, to get the laser eye surgery. And they paid me and my dad. But they gave my dad $50,000. My dad never made $50,000 in his life in a year. Yeah. And he said, so Jason, all I got to do is not wear my glass. And I said, yeah, daddy go do a little surgery in there. And he goes, surgery? And I said, yeah, just a little bit. You know, and it won't be nothing. So anytime I went to MRI, I'm claustrophobic, uh, anything, always had my dad hold my hand. He's my best friend. Hold my hand, dad, you know? And he used to be so mad. Like when he had to hold an MRI, he'd be like, everybody in the NBA scared of this little punk. You know, he'd be, I got to stand up and hold his hand all the time. You know, and hold my hand on the button. Cause you know, that button gets you out that MRI. Yeah. So. Once I'm getting the, the laser eye surgery, right, you're blind after that. You're blind for four hours. So I'm getting lead down to the car, and my dad's leading me. Yeah. So I'm like, Dad, you know, I get in the car. but that's you right, Dad? And he goes, yeah, it's me. I said, well, I'm blind. And he goes, yeah, you are. You is blind, sure enough. And I said, well, you should be blind, too. He goes, shit. He said, man, once I saw that smoke coming out your eye, he said, I told them white people they can keep their money. <laughs> oh, man. At that, at that point, no, he's just banking on the, the NBA yeah, check because like, I don't need the laser yeah, surgery yeah. check. He said, look, he said, ain't no smoke supposed to be coming out of man's eye. <laughs> I asked the doctor. The doctor said, I can keep my glass. And and, and um, I'm going to tell you what, Jay, you gave me that money, that 50000 about three months ago. I messed up about 300 If you let me 300 I'll give it back to him, and we'd be all right. <laughs> Well, that's a true story, man. Oh, that's amazing. Uh, I love it. <laughs> um, before before we, we wrap up, uh, we mentioned your time at St. John's with Luke Carnesecca um, led to your NBA career. But but what stands out about the time at St. John's? Is there a specific game? Is there a moment? Is there a practice? I know I know there's so much to take in, in those those four years, but um, just in terms of on the court, what, what stands out for, for you from you St. John's? On the court? Yeah. Yeah. Uh... The NIT championship, I was the MVP, 30 points, 18 rebounds. And look, nobody wanted to go to NIT, right? Yeah. So we tried to leave early. This is a true story. <laughs> Just so we get in and we ran a U-Haul, uh, I mean, a, a RV, right? And I'm the only one who drives tractor trailer. I'm a CDL. My dad has a trucking company. So Sean Muto, another seven-foot guy who played with us, right? Uh, he's like, I want to drive. I want to drive. So we were all escaping the NIT. Now, yeah. unbeknownst to the coaching staff. So we get on the turnpike, which is about for people that are not from New Jersey and New York, probably about 20 miles from New York. And <laughs> we all chip in to rip this RV. And when you go through the New Jersey turnpike, if, if you go through the car place, it has a six foot eight limit, right? Yeah. And you can't go through. And we not only went through that and tore off the whole top of the <laughs> RV, right? And squashed it and knocked the sign down, but we also knocked the two mirrors out. <laughs> so 
we had a point. We're going to Daytona because what do you want in the Bacardi Breeze? <laughs> right? You remember yeah. those, right? Wear oh, yeah. t-shirt contest. So we're heading down the turnpike, but Sean Muto, he can't get over to the right lane because we got no mirrors. <laughs> and he's caught in the left lane. Everybody bah, bah, blown the horn. So we had a point guard named Jason McCannon soaking wet. He was about 140 pounds. <laughs> so we'll take him and stick him out the passenger window. <laughs> <laughs> and he'd be outside New Mirror. So we would have to do this. We made it as far as Delaware until Coach Rutledge came down. And he had like one of them in Palace, like yeah. a police car. So we thought we'd get pulled over by the police. <laughs> we got pulled over by Ron Rutledge. It ended up being Coach Rutledge, yeah. And it got us back. And we ended up winning the NIT. And I ended up being MVP. And uh, I remember that story um, <laughs> uh, for sure. Wow, that's amazing. Let me, tell you, let, me tell you this last, let me tell you this last story. Yeah. So. Yeah. I'm playing with the Nets and Daryl Dawkins, Chocolate Thunder. Yeah. Caught me up. Greatest guy. You know, always wore these loud suits like Oakley. So he had this purple hat and a mustard yellow suit. And I'm bringing him to the 21 Club in New York. Very fancy place. We go in there and uh, he asked the lady after the order, he goes, Y'all got any hot sauce? Uh, she goes, Maybe some Tabasco sauce? He goes, Oh, don't worry about it. You know, he's six foot eleven, broke all the rim. He looks down and pulls out this big bottle. Of <laughs> I'm like, oh God, right? So he asked me, I'm said, well, well, why are we here, Dad? Why do you want to go to, you know, this fancy place you've never been to? And he's like, Jay, I'm gonna need a favor. So what's that? He goes, now he gotta be 50 something years old. He goes, I need to try out with the Nets. I'm like, oh. Right, so I go in. It's like putting I you in a tough spot. <laughs> tough spot, right? You know, but he got a big bottle of hot sauce in his hand. Yeah. You know, I won't get split open. So um, I said, all right, man, you know, I got the juice. Come in tomorrow and I'll have him. So I have him come in unbeknownst to the coach and the general manager, <laughs> right? So I just call upstairs, tell the ball boy, go get the coach, go get the general manager. And happen to be Ray Chambers, one of the owners who never comes in comes down. Yeah. And I go, hey, y'all, I want y'all to see Daryl Dawkins trying out. And they go, try it out. Right? Daryl got to be about 150 pounds overweight. <laughs> right? So he's just <laughs> shooting threes, Jesse. Like, he's never shot a three in his career. Yeah. He just breaks basketball. He's chocolate thunder. Right? Yeah. So I go, hey, uh, Daryl, because I'm a little intimidated. You know, he's like a mentor to me. I said, um, you might want to run up and down and uh, we want to see you do some other things. And they were like, Jay, we got to see him run at least before we put him on the team. He goes, you mean you want me to run all the way down there? I said, no, no, do the other basket, you know, like full court. And then come back down and do another layup. And he was like, run all the way down there and all the way back. I got to do that to make the nets. And I said, come on, man, work with me. I'll be the point guard. So I'm dribbling down. I give him a nice bounce pass. He goes up for a dunk. He misses it, right? Yeah. Badly. The ball bounces way over me. I run real quick to get it like it's no big deal. So I give him a bounce. I was like, just lay it in. He misses the layup. <laughs> Time, I run it back down. I give him a landing pass. He's on the left-hand side. He hits the bottom of the rim, hits him in the back of the head. He keeps running out the door. So I said, like, oh, my God. I said, he must have to go to the bathroom or something. So we all waiting around. I'm not trying to look at the owner, the general manager. So I look at the ball boy. I go, Chris, where's Daryl? He goes, oh, he got in his car and left. <laughs> so I call him on the cell phone. I go, Daryl, man, what happened? He goes, I changed my mind. <laughs> all it took was a couple trips down the court. That was all. You know, so I'll never make it as a general manager, but I'll make it on the Jesse and Jason show. You know, yes, you ab absolutely will make it. And you'll make it as a great teammate and friend. Uh, man, so many great stories. There's so much more to come in the, in the weeks to come. We're going to have a lot of great guests. We're going to have many, many more great stories from the, the encyclopedia of stories here, Jason Williams. Jason, thanks so much. And uh, as we said, we got a lot to come. Uh, so we'll be back with a lot more here on the J Squared Podcast. Signing off for the first one. We'll see you on the next one. Great job, Jesse.